Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the State Department. Uh, happy Monday. I'll turn it over to all of you. Joe? Good morning, Patrick. Um, can we start with Syria? Yep. Um, the Secretary today in um, uh, Riyadh um, talked about empowering the Syrian opposition in their battle against um, Assad. And he, he was also asked about arms reaching the opposition. And he talked about it was all right. He said something to the effect that it was okay if um, moderate members of the opposition were given some arms because they would know how to use them. Could you expand on that a little bit more, what he meant by empowering the rebels and, um, and talk a bit about this, the idea that the moderate opposition can have arms? Um, again, I really can't improve on the Secretary's words, but uh, broadly speaking, what we're talking about, Joe, is that, uh, and this is part of going back to Rome and then going forward, we really are working to empower the opposition so that they can uh, help govern new space. So, first of all, you saw over the weekend, and I just want to highlight the really courageous uh, choice by Syrian Opposition Coalition President uh, Al Khatib to go inside of Syria. Um, so, we commend him for his courage and his dedication to connect with Syrians who continue to suffer from the regime's violence on a daily basis. So, you know, we saw him go in. This is part of um, our non lethal assistance to get them up to, gov to be governing spaces. Um, and to show the Syrians really an option for a new day. Um, clearly, many people uh, have wanted and have long fought for a new day in Syria, but others who have been on the fence have to see that there is uh, the ability for a new way forward where their rights and interests will be protected as well. Uh, in terms of the comment on arms, uh, really this is in the context of uh, it's the Syrian opposition themselves. We're trying to uh, you know, we don't provide arms, we provide non-lethal assistance, but um, they're starting to make sure that the moderate, legitimate opposition uh, is getting some of that assistance. So he's really talking about their ability um, to provide those arms to people who want a free democratic Syria. Another thing to highlight, Joe, from the weekend is that uh, there were uh, elections uh, for the Provincial Council of Aleppo uh, that were held in southern Turkey. We view this as a positive sign of the opposition's commitment to free and democratic procedures, uh, even though campaigning and elections weren't possible inside of Syria uh, because of the pervasive insecurity and, of course, the use of scuds in Aleppo province. But, um, you know, this is as we help them prepare for local governance. Um, really, it's a Syrian-led process, but we're the international community trying to provide them with the assistance so that they can prepare for that day. Um, so really, that's the broad framework. but. You know, there's a lot of weapons in Syria. Um, clearly, as the Secretary highlighted, Iran, Hezbollah, Russia continue uh, to provide arms. Um, other countries have made their sovereign decisions. We have not uh, to arm the opposition, but um, that's sort of the broader context. There's a, there's a somewhat a shift in the American thinking on this because, as you mentioned, you, you know, it's non lethal support from the Americans, <laughs> and, and you've mentioned that other states and nations are making their own decisions about whether to supply arms to the opposition. But in the past, there was um, uh, an American reluctance to, uh, to allow the possibility of arms going into Syria to the opposition. This would seem to suggest that it's okay as long as, we're, as, long as the arms are reaching the moderates. Is that what the Kerry was, Secretary Kerry was trying to say? Well, look, go back and read his remarks carefully. I can't improve on them or, or sort of reparse them. They're very clear. But... Uh, the point being, the context of this is that we've been concerned about some extremist uh, opposition members, those who don't share uh, the views of the vast majority of the opposition, want a free, peaceful, democratic uh, future. And, you know, as long as Assad is raining scuds down on the people of Syria, as long as he's slaughtering his own people, uh, the opposition is going to fight back. Um, and, and that's just a, a reality on the ground, and they're going to have to protect themselves. So um, our position hasn't changed. Uh, we still provide non-lethal assistance, uh, but other countries have made other decisions, and the opposition uh, is working to get those to moderate elements and not those that, that share an extremist or, or uh, sort of extremist ideology. Is it fair to characterize it as an evolution, perhaps, in the thinking of the uh, American position on, on the arms going into, that are already going into Syria? I really wouldn't characterize it one way or another. I think the Secretary's remarks speak clearly for themselves. And, we're working with the uh, unarmed, unarmed opposition in terms of our non-lethal assistance. We also said that we're going to provide non-lethal assistance 
uh, two groups, part of the Syrian Opposition Council that inc include uh, the Supreme Military Council. So that has been the evolution. You heard it announced back in Rome. Uh, his re remarks today were in a different context. And can I ask about the on the Aleppo elections? Was there some, some U.S. support that went towards organizing those and um, making sure they could um, they could be carried out? Um, we did not play a role in organizing the elections. We provided some non-lethal training to the civilian opposition in terms of uh, some administrative training and that type of governance training. But these elections were absolutely Syrian-led, uh, Syrian-run, and really a positive sign. So, um, you know, we welcome the step, but but this was absolutely uh, an indigenous Syrian effort. Yeah, just follow up one right, go ahead, Michelle was waiting. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> Secretary or has Secretary Kerry asked the Saudis to provide their arms to or the uh, military aids to the moderates instead of giving them to the to a Nusra uh, front? Uh, look, I can't get into our private diplomacy, and countries have made their own sovereign decisions. But the bottom line is, you know, we support uh, the moderate opposition. We support the opposition that is looking for uh, a democratic, inclusive, and moderate Syria. So those are the people we are supporting uh, with our non-lethal assistance, and, and others are making their decisions. Have you conveyed this message, do you think, to, to the Saudis? And uh, Secretary Kerry will convey it to, uh, to the other Arab states that he will visit? I mean, again, I'm not going to get into our the, the exact form of our discussions, but we're clear in public and private who we're supporting and why we think they're the people who, who need to receive uh, all of the international community's support uh, to try to change Assad's calculation. You mentioned uh, about Russian arms. Uh, yep. Just uh, uh, I'm wondering, uh, this has been going on for about two years, and uh, the Russian officials have been saying that they have been fulfilling the contracts. Do you know when these contracts are expiring? Do you uh, have you had a chance to ask whether the, when was the last time they they renewed some of the contracts? Because this just goes on and on. Look, I really refer you to the Russian authorities, but I can tell you that the secretary did raise in his bilateral with Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, our strong concern. He strongly urged Russia to stop providing the regime weapons, attack helicopters, air defense systems, and access to Russian banks. So, you know, it's just, in our mind, unconscionable to continue to provide military assistance to the Assad regime. It's really only the uh, extremists that stand to gain from, from that position. So it's something that we have raised with the Russians. In terms of what they're continuing to supply, I refer you to them. Uh, over the weekend, Prime Minister of uh, Iraq, Maliki, uh, said that if uh, if the Assad regime falls, it's going to be heaven, uh, and sectarianism is going to increase, and apparently was saying that th this should not happen. Uh, what's your uh, position on, on, on that? Uh, I hadn't seen his new comments, but this is something that he's talked about in the past and I responded to last week, but, um, you know, Prime Minister Maliki has talked about the, the need for the dictatorship to end. Um, we share a, a common concern about extremism, um, and Iraq has expressed its concern about the level of violence and the extremist elements who seek to foment violence and capitalize on the situation in Syria. So this is something they've been, they've been clear about and have said in the past. There have been also reports that some of the Iraq forces uh, uh, got involved uh, with the fight uh, at the border and they've been firing on rebels or different various reports. Have you been able to uh, confirm those reports? You know, we've seen some contradictory reports about fighting that occurred at the border crossing uh, and whether Iraqi, Iraqi forces engaged. So we're discussing the situation with the government of Iraq and urge all parties to act with restraint in these sensitive border areas. But we really don't have further information. We've seen, a, you know, conflicting reports. A follow-up on this, Patrick. Michelle. Uh, uh, 42 Syrian troops and 11 uh, Iraqi soldiers got killed in an ambush today in, inside Iraq. Uh, do you have uh, anything on this? And the Iraqi authorities have blamed uh, Al-Qaeda. You know, Michelle, we have seen those reports, but we cannot confirm at this time what occurred. So we really refer you to the government of Iraq for further details. But we have seen the report. Do, Samir. Do you know if uh, Secretary Kerry uh, called Maliki during this trip or if he's planning to visit Iraq also? Uh, you know, I'm not sure that they've been able to connect uh, 
on this visit, uh, whether they've been able to connect on the phone, but I'll look into it and get back to you. Thanks. Go ahead, John. I wondered if you'd seen, if the department had seen the uh, interview given by President Assad to the Sunday Times over the weekend, in which he, uh, he, he said that he would take part in dialogue if it was... Uh, if there was no arms, if the, if, the militant, if the rebel opposition put down their arms. And he also rejected the idea that his um, departure would end the bloodshed, which is something that actually analysts have been talking about, that even if Assad goes, the bloodshed's just going to disintegrate into sectarian violence. Yeah. Could you talk to that, please? Well, uh, Joe, the bottom line is we did see the interview, but we have seen no serious indication that the regime is willing to engage in a genuine negotiation process that would lead to the formation of a transitional governing authority. So they continue to rain down scuds. You know, we've seen this talk, uh, but it's, it, it's actions that matter, and we haven't seen that. You know, in the interview, you see him saying uh, something along, along the lines of, uh, you know, a real patriot should stay in his country. Well, what a real patriot should do is stop slaughtering his own people, stop raining missiles down uh, against his own citizens, against women and children. That's what a real patriot should do. But what about this idea that even if he goes, there's still going to, that the, the, uh, there still will be bloodshed? I mean, that's not just Assad who's saying that. That's people who are not involved in the conflict who are saying that well, too. We are we are concerned about the situation in Syria. We are concerned about uh, the further disintegration of the state. And so our assistance and our planning is trying to help uh, provide for a better day, so that uh, when Assad does fall, and he will, uh, we're able to uh, not only the Syrians but then the international community help. Uh, provide for a better day. And so that's what some of our non-lethal assistance is designed to do to help them uh, build up sort of the uh, institutions to help govern, uh, to provide an alternative. Um, but clearly there, there are issues of sectarianism. They're, Syria is a very complicated place, but we're doing all we can to provide for uh, as quick and peaceful an end to this as possible to stop the bloodshed. That is a U.S. policy. We want an end to the bloodshed. And so the fastest and easiest way to do that is for Assad to step aside uh, and for us to move to a transitioning uh, governing body with full uh, executive authority. How about intelligence? Do you share intelligence with the Syrian opposition or with your allies who provide arms to this opposition? You know, we don't talk about intelligence or intelligence sharing from this podium, so okay. nice try. Lala. Can you go over to South Asia? Sure. Uh, one, one, one more on Syria. One more on Syria. After, after Roma's meeting, uh, uh, have you set a time and date for our Khatib visit to Washington? Uh, we don't have a time and a date still, but you know, the Secretary, uh, you saw him, uh, had a lengthy meeting with, meeting with Mr. Al Khatib. They spoke after their meeting. Uh, when we have more information about a potential meeting here in Washington, we'd be happy to share that. One more quick. Uh, One more on Syria. Sixty million. Uh, the latest uh, aid, sixty million. Is there a way you can give us a more detail uh, on that? There are various reports whether armored vehicles or body armor or uh, what, what exactly is going to be about in the sixty million aid. Well, we talked about this a lot last week. We've put out a number of transcripts and background briefings to clarify. You know that there's three general categories, 385 million of humanitarian, 115 million of non-lethal support, and a third category which will provide uh, some of that in-kind assistance to uh, the Syrian Opposition Council and the, the Supreme Military uh, Command. So, um, you know, I'd be happy to get you some, of, some more detail afterward, but that's where we stand. Elise. Um, on Iran. Yes. Um, the Iranian ambassador to the UN gave an um, interview to CNN's uh, Fareed Zakari yesterday, and the tone was very positive. And he said that the talks, you know, show some promise. He said that it looks as if, um, you know, things are moving in the right direction, and that the Iran was open to uh, talks with the United States. So, how serious do you view this offer, and whether you think that there's really an opportunity for direct talks with Iran? Well, look, Elise, you know where we are on this. We said the talks were useful. Um, we've long said, the President has said going back since the beginning of this administration, that we're willing to engage in bilateral diplomacy with the Iranians in the context of the P5 plus 1 uh, process. But the bottom line is we need to see concrete confidence-building measures on the side of the Iranians. So we'll go into these next meetings uh, April. What specifically? What kind of confidence We talked about this last week. We're not going to get into the details of our negotiation on this. But Iran knows very clearly from us what we laid out in Almaty uh, that we're expecting concrete confidence building measures. So March 18th in Istanbul, there'll be a, uh, a technical meeting where we'll continue to refine and discuss these issues. 
and another political directors meeting uh, April 5th and 6th in Almaty. So, um, you know, we want them to take con uh, concrete confidence building measures uh, to get as uh, to pave the way to get some momentum heading toward a longer term comprehensive agreement. He also said that um, the amount of uranium that Iran would not have to ship out is not really the kind of main sticking point. But isn't this exactly what um, the U.S. and Israel are mainly concerned about when we talk about red lines, the amount of uranium that Iran would have to ship out? Look, I'm just, I'm not going to get into the details of the negotiation. You heard Toria say this uh, about a week or so ago that, you know, Iran currently has enough enriched uranium to fuel the Tehran research reactor for at least a decade. Uh, and its recent actions would allow Iran to further increase its enriched stockpiles without any clear civilian purpose. So we've said that before. The bottom line, though, is at least we're just not going to get into the details of, of uh, the P5 plus one process. And then lastly, he also said that, you know, the rhetoric coming from you in terms of this tough rhetoric and military action is on the table, um, you know, very tough rhetoric specifically from Vice President Biden and, and others um, is not helpful to the momentum of progress. You know, kind of the same line that you're, you know, talking about, you know, wanting to negotiate, but your tough rhetoric, you know, belies that. So do you think that the rhetoric is kind of getting in the way of meaningful progress? Iran knows, and they saw our serious updated proposal. They know the steps that we want to take. They know so that... So why use negative rhetoric? I mean, if you're serious about negotiating and you think your proposal is serious, then why would you... Um, handicap the chances of it working with this rhetoric that doesn't signify that you're serious. Look, at least I haven't seen specifically what rhetoric they're referring to. You know that we've long had a dual track approach where we're increasing the pressure to try to get the Iranians uh, to make the strategic decision to take these concrete but measures. But is rhetoric helpful in that regard? I Look, mean, I understand your pressure with when it's sanctions or other types of aspects of diplomacy, but does you know is rhetoric really helpful? Look, we've described the talks as useful. Um, we're going to continue along with the process, but I'm not going to characterize it further. Can I ask him? Um, uh, Joe, go ahead. You have, do you have a follow-up on this? Iran. Go ahead. Iran, yeah. oh, Joe, oh, yeah. and then we'll go yeah. back. Um, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu just addressed uh, by webcast the um, APAC uh, yep. meeting ha happening in Washington, and he said that Iran had moved closer towards the, the red line, which is Israel's red line, obviously, since the American hasn't set one. America hasn't set one. Is, is that your understanding of the situation? Has have they moved closer? Have they managed to make more progress in Would, their nuclear in their uranium enrichment? Joe, you know, I hadn't seen his remarks uh, since I came down here, but uh, you heard the secretary say this morning that uh, diplomacy is the preferred choice today. Um, so the window uh, is open for diplomacy, but it's not open indefinitely, and and that's our position. And when the window will be. Uh, you know that we want uh, Iran to make their strategic decision to come in line with international obligations, and we'll continue to push for that. And it is not open indefinitely. But is there a time frame? Uh, we're not going to get into uh, characterizing it further. In the back. Patrick, you just said that uh, the two-track approach is still the way you're going to go, which means one track is the sanctions. But it seems like Iran is expecting easing of sanctions and in the near future, because just yesterday the Iranian foreign minister said that um, today, not only sanctions will not be intensified, but we will be witnessing the easing of sanctions. Was any promises made to them in Almaty for them to expect this? You heard me talk about this last week. Um, we're willing to take reciprocal measures if they take uh, concrete measures, but I'm not going to get into it beyond that. So they have to take their measures first before you take reciprocal measures. I'm not going to get into the sequence of You said of reciprocal this. measures They're if reciprocal. they take concrete. Reciprocal means that you would take them afterwards. <coughs> Look, I'm not going to get into the sequencing of this. The diplomacy continues. Please. One last one on around before we move right. on. Right. Um, did the Iranians have any proposal in, in Almaty for the P5 plus one? Um, you know, again, I'll let the Iranians characterize their uh, their position and what they did at the meetings. I think that'd be most appropriate. But did they offer like the West's proposal that was put on the table? Did they have another one? Again, I'll let them characterize what they did at the meeting. Uh, suffice it to say, we're going to go into a technical uh, experts meeting, and then we'll go into political directors to continue to flesh this out about how all of these issues will work, timing, sequence, everything. Change topic, please. Um, on Afghanistan, um, Valley Nasser, who used to be at the State Department, just came out with a new book detailing um, a little bit about the work with Richard Holbrook and how President Obama's White House team kind of shut him out. 
Specifically, he writes that the White House encouraged the U.S. ambassadors in Afghanistan and Pakistan to go around the State Department and work with the White House directly, undermining their own agency. I'd like your response to that, whether that's an accurate assessment and um, whether the State Department felt that the White House was um, taking too much control over the Afghan AFPAC file. Well, you know, Elise, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to comment on the specifics in this book or interagency discussions. Why not? Uh, that's not something that we do from this podium. Well, there's um, a specific charge laid out in this book from someone who used to be in this building. Look, I'm not going to comment on a, a former official's characterization one way or another or our interagency processes one way or another, but let me talk a little bit about Afghanistan, where we are, some of the progress we've no, made. No, I don't, I mean, I mean I'm specifically, I'm not you can talk about, I'm happy to hear what you have to say okay. about Afghanistan, but specifically, do you feel that the State Department has equal equity in the policy deliberations on Afghanistan and Pakistan? Uh, look, I'm just not going to... You don't, you don't know? I'm not going to comment do? on a former official's character. Well, I'm not asking you to, so don't comment on his book, but specifically, do you feel as if the State Department has equal equity on the policy deliberations on Afghanistan and Pakistan? We have an excellent working relationship with our White House and interagency colleagues, and let me just tell you a little bit about where we are in Afghanistan, because that's some of the thrust of the book is talking about uh, policy development in Afghanistan. You know, we've increased the capacity of Afghan security forces to fight insurgents. Uh, transitioning Afghan, Afghan security lead, uh, transitioning to an Afghan security lead, building an enduring partnership with Afghanistan. Um, we now have Afghan forces uh, leading nearly 90% 90, 90 of operations across the country. Um, we've signed the strategic partnership agreement. We're working on a new, negotiating a new bilateral security agreement. Um, we're working on preparations for a free, inclusive, and transparent election in 2014. So we really stand behind the record of the progress we made in Afghanistan, but beyond that, I'm not going to get into interagency discussions. But it's not a new charge. I mean, it's a charge that analysts are making around Washington that um, the, the foreign policy is being um, decided in the White House with uh, not enough input or very little input from the State Department. We make our input, but I'm just not going to characterize it Are you listened that. to? Do you feel that you're listened to properly in the White House? Look, the State Department has, we have an excellent working relationship, as I said, with the White House, with the interagency. You and can't say whether you feel as if you're getting equal input? Uh, I'm, look, I'm not going to characterize some sort of historical discussion about uh, what happened in years past. Uh, all I'm going to say is... I don't think it's historical because it also goes to what's happening today. I've said what House. I can on this. Uh, I, think, I think we've done what we can here. On Thanks. Afghanistan yep. itself, uh, the a Taliban leader today said that they are uh, planning to have a political movement as uh, U.S. tries to plans to withdraw from Afghanistan. How do you see this? They would have a political movement? Yeah. You know, I hadn't seen those remarks. You know where we are on reconciliation, and uh, we believe peace and reconciliation is the surest way to end violence. Uh, so we continue to have the objective of Afghans sitting down with Afghans to determine the future of their country. Um, and obviously we want those who... Uh, our combatants or who are opposing the legitimate Afghan government to, of course, lay down their arms and participate uh, politically and through the Afghan constitution. Uh, last time we spoke on this, um, you said that Taliban hasn't responded to the U.S. call of, of peace, peace talks. Have they now? Uh, it has been a month or so. Uh, you know, I don't have an update for you beyond where you know where we are. You heard, obviously, what uh, President Obama said. Uh, what President Karzai, President Karzai said when they were here, but I don't have an update for you. And can you cross the border and go to Karachi, where uh, there has been terrorist attack and a lot of people have died? Uh, what is your, I mean, there have been series of terrorist attacks inside Pakistan in the last few weeks. Uh, what is your assessment of the security situation inside Pakistan now? Um, well, thanks for raising that, Lalit. You know, yesterday we did uh, see a violent attack in Karachi with more than uh, 50 people killed and many others injured. Uh, we joined, you saw the embassy put out a statement Ambassador Richard Olson did overnight, offering the family of those, families of those killed our deepest condolences and wishing those injured a speedy recovery. Uh, we do remain concerned about extremist violence of all kinds. Uh, intolerance and violence against innocent civilians is an assault on the values of the people of Pakistan and a threat to a prosperous future for all citizens. So we stand with the people of Pakistan in condemning this violence, um, and uh, it's really a senseless and inhumane act, in our opinion. Uh, given these attacks, has Pakistan sought any specific assistance from the U.S. to address these challenges? I know you have been helping them in counterterrorism operations. Um, you know, I'll have to look into that. I'm not aware that, uh, of any specific assistance they've asked for. And what impact the sequestration would have on your counterterrorism assistance to Pakistan? Uh, you know, again, we're not in a place where we can make any determinations about exactly how each account is going to be cut and what it will mean for specific bilateral assistance. We're not in a position to make that. I see some folks okay. in the back of the room. Yeah. 
Hi, sir. Go ahead. Tell me who you are. Uh, Nick Hart from Feature Story News. Okay. Uh, changing to North Korea, I just okay. wanted to ask about uh, Dennis Rodman's trip. I know that you made some comments uh, end of last I week. I feeling you guys weren't going to let me get down from here without... Uh, <laughs> Well, Another round on this, so... Yeah. <laughs> well, obviously, we've heard more from him over the weekend with this interview uh, with ABC, uh, especially talking about Kim Jong-un wanting to uh, get President Obama to pick up the phone. Uh, considering these comments, is there any desire within uh, the State Department to capitalise on this, to try and reach out to the regime at this time? You know, you know where we are. We have, a direct, we have direct channels of communication with the DPRK. They know how to get in touch with us. Um, but... Instead of spending their money on staging sporting events, the North Korean regime should focus on the well-being of its people, and it should come in line with its international obligations. Um, so, you know, um, quite frankly, North Korean words and stunts such as this have no meaning. What matters is the actions they take and the need to come in line with their international obligations. What about any desire to, to reach out to Mr. Rodman and debrief him, considering he's probably spoken uh, more to, to the leader in North Korea than anyone else has in the country? You know, we talked about this last week. We're well, you know, we welcome uh, those who want to get in touch with us after a visit to North Korea. We take the call, but uh, well, we haven't I mean, been in touch. Given the fact that you have zero relations with this regime and you don't, no American diplomat has ever met with the guy, why wouldn't, even if, you know, Obviously, that you're not going to conduct diplomacy with Dennis Rodman, but why wouldn't you that's want for sure. every? <laughs> that's fine, but why wouldn't you want every little nugget of information that you could possibly get from anybody that's been in a room with this guy? I'm not saying you would conduct diplomacy, but you know what? You know what? What it was his demeanor? What? Why are you not curious in any way about what this guy would have to say? Look, I. If he wants to get in touch with us, well, we're happy to Why do you have email. to wait for that? I mean, clearly you have a, a big policy problem with North Korea's launching yep. nuclear weapons. Every little nugget of information might piece together a puzzle that you could better understand this guy. At least why would it what our diplomacy is focused on is bringing North Korea in line with its international obligations. And what we've seen from this young man since he's taken power... You mean the leader of North Korea? The leader of North Korea. Not Dennis Rodman. He's not a young man, but the leader of North Korea. Uh, our provocative actions, ballistic missile tests, nuclear tests, continue starvation of people, uh, continuing not to focus on the, on the lives of his own citizens. So there is a chance for him to change course, and we haven't seen that. But stunts that, you know... Uh, Don't you think you're standing on ceremony a little bit to wait for Dennis Rodman to call you? If he's willing to call you and talk to you about it, why can't you just pick up the phone and ask, you know, what he saw in the country? Maybe he saw something that could be useful to you. Uh, I mean, look, I just don't have anything further for you on this, Elise. I think we've done this one. Go ahead in the back. Yes. Uh, Rodman is not a U.S. officer uh, channel, right? I, I, I couldn't hear you. What would you say? Mr. Rodman is not a uh, U.S. officer channel. But why not uh, will the U.S. appoint him as ambassador to North Korea? <laughs> 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 I'm not even sure I can dignify that with a response. Well, he said that he's a very good friend with Kim Jong Un. Let me let me repeat what I said last week. I'll just say it here again. Dennis Rodman has never been a player in our diplomacy. Uh, he does not represent the views of the United States. He is a private American. But, but any private American, what did you want to speak to any private American that's been in the country? Uh, we're happy to. We haven't been in touch with them. Uh, if he reaches out to us, I'll, did anybody from this know. building meet with Eric Schmidt and um, Bill Richardson when they came back? I'll have to look into that and get if back to you. If you could take the question. Okay, moving on. Uh, the There's a report that the secretary will be going to East Asia uh, following his trip to uh, Israel with the president. I'm just wondering if you have any information you could share with mm -hmm. us about that. You know, I don't have anything for you on upcoming secretarial travel, but when we get closer to his next trip, we'll. Certainly be in touch with you. Alala, you've been patient for a sec. On Bangladesh, do you have yep. a take of the security situation in Bangladesh following this uh, series of I do. protests that's going on there? And uh, India's president is also visiting Bangladesh currently. Do you have any comments on that? Too? What was the second point? India's president is also visiting okay. Bangladesh. Well, while we are encouraged that the situation is beginning to calm down, uh, we are saddened by the reports of over 70 people killed during protests across Bangladesh. Uh, we also continue to be concerned by reported attacks on Hindu temples and homes. Um, so while engaging in peaceful protest is a fundamental democratic right, we firmly believe violence is never the answer. 
Uh, and so we continue to encourage all Bangladeshis to peacefully express their views and look to the government of Bangladesh to ensure the safety of all its citizens. And how do you see uh, the Bangladeshi government handling the situation? Look, I don't think I'm going to characterize it other than to say we've seen things begin to calm down and uh, we continue to uh, encourage the government of Bangladesh to uh, ensure the safety of all its citizens. Can I ask about um, Malin? Oh, uh, why don't you do, I think Scott's been really patient. Scott, why don't you go? Uh, elections are underway in Kenya. Yep. You know, okay, but some violence. What's your assessment so far? Uh, so you're right, Scott, and I think you heard me talk a little bit about Kenyan elections last Friday uh, and our strong message that we're encouraging uh, free, fair, peaceful elections in Kenya. Uh, so today Kenyans are voting. Uh, throughout their country, there are reports of high levels of voter turnout. Uh, the media and election, uh, and election observers report that the situation is generally calm and peaceful. Uh, we commend the Kenyan people, many of whom have patiently waited in long lines to vote for their active and peaceful participation in the election. And we urge all candidates and their supporters to maintain peace as the results are tabulated and announced. So we've also seen some uh, isolated instances of violence in the co uh, down by the coast and in the northeast. We condemn any violence in the strongest terms and express our condolences to the families of those victims. Is it your opinion that the Kenyan authorities are doing uh, what they should be to confront those isolated incidents of violence? Uh, I mean, again, we've seen the reports overnight. I don't have an update on, on the response, but uh, our general impression, again, this is still ongoing, is that they've been generally calm and peaceful and orderly and that uh, things are working fairly well. So, But we continue to urge for people to vote, to participate, and to be peaceful and calm as, as results come in. Joe, you wanted to get to Mali. Yes. Yep. Um, last week we had um, reports about the death of Abu Zaid, which Al-Qaeda yep. itself now seems to be confirming. Um, and over the weekend uh, in Mali, and, yep. and over the weekend there are reports that um, another uh, Islamist leader, Mokhtar Bamukta, has, has been killed. Do you have any information you can share with us? Um, yeah. So we have seen reports that AQIM leader Mokhtar Bamukhtar was killed on March 2nd by French and Chadian forces. Uh, we have no confirmation about Mokhtar's current status, so we refer you to French and Chadian authorities. And also, uh, uh, we have reports that the commander of Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, uh, Maghreb's Mali wing, Abu Zaid, was killed on March 2nd by French and Chadian forces, but we're also not able to confirm that at this time. So in both of these cases, we really refer you to the French and uh, Chadian for, uh, well, officials. Isn't one of the issues that the Chadians are saying that he's yeah. dead, but the French yeah. haven't necessarily confirmed? So until they both confirm, is that when you would take confirmation? I mean, we as a U.S. government uh, are not able to confirm either case, either independently or otherwise. So we're just not in a position to do that. Um, but we'll continue to wait to hear more what, from what's our counterparts. What's your assessment about how the fighting's going on the ground? Um, you know, I don't have an update on the fighting. You know that we have, we continue to. Um, you know, we've repeatedly affirmed our support for the French mission, for the African troops that uh, have deployed uh, regional efforts to counter the terrorist groups in the region. But in terms of what's happened on the ground recently, um, I don't have uh, uh, anything updated overnight or in the past day or so. But I'll look into it and see if we have any more information on the ground. You know, Joe, that what we really want is, of course, the French have made significant gains, but we want them to hold those gains and be able to turn over uh, to the African counterparts uh, as quickly as they can. So we support that process. That's why we're providing uh, significant assistance. But uh, that's the broad stroke, the broad frame of what we're looking for in Mali. But let me see if I have an, uh, a ground situation update for you. Um, the French Defense Minister, Yves Le Drian, was saying at one point that uh, they hope to leave by March and turn it over. Do you think that's a realistic uh, timetable, time frame? You know, I can't really make an observation one way or the other, other, other than to say we're working very hard. Obviously, there's some plans up at the UN to see how we can put the African-led international support mission in Mali under UN authority. Uh, we think that would help speed uh, and, and provide uh, uh, an appropriate framework. But in terms of timing, I just don't have anything for you. Do you have an update on the UN efforts, whether there's a resolution due this week? Uh, I don't. I know we continue to work up in New York, but I don't have an update on our diplomacy up what in New York. What about an update on the resolution on North Korea? Do you think that that will be coming soon? Uh, I also don't have an update. Okay, time for a couple of more. Go ahead, you've been very patient. Um, Greece and Turkey. Uh, do you have any comment on the, today's meeting between the Prime Ministers of uh, Greece and Turkey? And also, do, did you have any involvement in setting this meeting? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I really refer you to the two of them. So I just don't have a readout for you. If we do, uh, if we have something further for you, we'll look into it. 
on Turkey, uh, Prime Minister Erdogan's remarks on Zionism, uh, Secretary Clinton, raised, Secretary Kerry raised the issue in Turkey, but before the meeting with the Prime Minister. Uh, so according to Turkish officials, it, there has been a misunderstanding the meaning of the Zionism in Turkey and international arena. My question is, have you been uh, reached kind of understanding and uh, or do you still have the same uh, same concerns after the meeting? Look, I'm not aware of any translation clarification. <coughs> you heard what the White House said last week. You heard how the secretary characterized it as objectionable language. It's something he raised very frankly with his counterparts in Turkey, but beyond that, I don't have an update for you. Okay, in the back. I just wanted to ask uh, about comments made by uh, former National Security Advisor General Jim Jones at the end of last week. Uh, he talked about the phrase pivot to Asia uh, being perhaps the most regrettable phrase that the administration uh, had ever come up with, had ever used. Uh, I just wanted your thoughts whether there were similar regrets within the department here uh, about the use of the phrase. I, look, I, I hadn't seen those comments at all. You know the administration's strong commitment to the Asia Pacific region. It's driven by our enduring interests, uh, and it won't change. Uh, as President Obama said, we will deepen our engagement in the region in order to seize opportunities for a more secure and prosperous future. I just hadn't seen those remarks uh, in specific. And in, I mean, in terms of those regrets, I mean, is there any desire to, to talk to people within the region to mention that there have been these regrets and whether there might now be some sort of policy, policy shift or change? Uh, I'm, I don't think I can further elaborate on another former official's characterization one way or another. But the pivot to Asia remains in place then? Look, we're absolutely, you know, we've said that we're going to rebalance to Asia, that uh, this is something that we've been working on and, and the President has a strong commitment. It, it, any, it, plan, any plans for the Secretary to visit Asia? Again, I think this was asked early in the briefing when we have more information on future secretarial travel, we'll announce it. but. He obviously will travel to Asia and looks forward to it. We just don't have anything to announce yet. In terms of the phrase, pivot to Asia, is it more of a case of uh, wanting to do it but just not using that phrase? Are we no longer using that phrase now? Uh, look, I mean, we're absolutely, this is something that the administration has been working on in terms of um, our commitment to the Asia-Pacific. Obviously, it's something in the 21st century where we're very aware of, of the challenges but also the opportunities in Asia. So uh, we'll continue to pursue those robustly in, in, a, in a range of uh, different areas. So. So, so it's still a pivot, but just without the name? I, I mean, I'm just not going to characterize it further. Scott. Uh, UAE. Yep. Some 90 people are on trial today, including uh, human rights lawyers, some judges, teachers, and some student leaders. As allegation is that they're part of a group that wanted to bring down the government. Human Rights Watch has expressed some concerns about the whereabouts of some of those defendants and the access that their attorneys have had to some of the both their clients and the allegations against them. Is that something that you're following? Yep. And if you have concerns about that, have you raised them with the UAE government? Yeah, thanks, Scott. Uh, the United States is consistently engaged with the government of the United Arab Emirates in regard to the detention of political activists. Uh, we've urged a swift and fair trial for those detained that allows them to present their defense. The legal process is now underway. We continue to urge the UAE to ensure that the judicial process is open and transparent. Assessment that it has been open and transparent for these defendants? Uh, again, I don't think I'm going to give a grade to this ongoing process, but it's something we continue to urge. Okay, Joe, Sorry, you have one more? To, yeah, one last one. Um, I think I know what you're going to say, but um, there was a delegation of American and British delegate uh, de detectives who visited Tripoli last week to investigate the 1988 Pan Am bom bombing. I wondered if you could talk to us about that. and. Well, generally, I mean, it was 1988, and there's been lots of... There was a guy who was in prison and then released for it. There's been compensation paid by Libya. Who, who are you trying to still identify for possible uh, trial? Joe, I'll have to look in and, uh, into whether we have an update one way or another. I imagine I'll have to refer to the Department of Justice, but I'm happy to look into it. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you.